towards the end of last last week, we mentioned that okay, why, what do we benefit from doing from using wireless communications? We don't need wires. We can be mo mobile, and but to get them, we have a number of challenges to address. In that, compared to wired communications, wire the wireless channel or the wireless uh, any wireless communications is generally performs worse than wired communications. So we need to deal with that. Not just performance, sometimes sometimes security is a problem as well. We won't try and deal with that in this course, security. And we come up, or we summarized a simple model for wireless transmission, where we have some transmitter, takes uh, an electrical signal, and the antenna transmits some signal to a receiver. We transmit at some power level, our uh, output signal. Uh, the antenna, in fact, introduces some gain. It increases the strength of the signal. The signal attenuates. It gets weaker as it travels across some distance. It's received at some signal strength by the receiver. The receiving antenna introduces some gain, and we get the final received signal power, PR. And typically with devices, with receivers in particular, we, the received signal must be strong enough such that the device can decode the data that was transmitted in that signal. It depends upon how that device was, uh, was built, the characteristics of the device. In this course, we primarily care about the distance at which we can transmit. Okay, how far can we transmit? at some transmit power such that the receiver can receive and decode the data. We'll make some simplifying assumptions like if we have a transmission range of 10 meters, we'll assume that if our transmitter and receiver are separated by 11 meters, they will not be able to communicate. Okay, that's, if you hear transmission range, it's the maximum distance at which the transmitter and receiver can communicate successfully. In practice, it's not that clear cut and that uh, okay sometimes at 10 meters 10 and a half meters it will be okay in other cases nine meters it will be okay so that the range is not a, a, a clear cut number but for our simple analysis we'll assume many of the wi wireless technologies we look at have some approximate range at which they can transmit we're interested in the range because if we're going to deploy a network to provide some coverage of an area, so provide access to everyone within some area, then the range at which our, say, our base station or access point transmits impacts upon how many people it will cover. The larger the range, the more people it will cover. So that's one reason we care about the range. Our device transmits with some power. When we talk about mobile devices, the transmit power is important because the more transmit power we use, the more power or the more energy the, de the, the wireless transmitter consumes of your battery. So the higher the transmit power, the further we can transmit. That's a good thing. But the higher the transmit power, the more energy we need to consume for the device, that is, the faster your battery will go flat on your mobile device especially. So we want a high transmit power for high range, but we want a low transmit power to consume battery life, uh, to preserve battery life. We care about data rate. Often we're talking about how fast can we send our data. Many applications, the, the data rate is important for uh, determining the performance of that application. So we generally, we'd like higher data rate. We care about the frequency at which we transmit our signals because of several reasons. Different frequencies have different physical characteristics. Some signals in the infrared fr frequency cannot pass through walls, but uh, Wi-Fi signals using a different frequency can pass through walls. So depending upon our usage scenario, the frequency is important. Also, some frequencies are considered what's, or in what's called the unlicensed band. You don't need a license to use them. You don't have to pay money to use them. 
Wi-Fi as an example. Other frequencies are licensed. To use them, you need to pay money. So you need to consider the frequency from the perspective of the cost. And another thing we care about frequency is because if I'm using one frequency and someone nearby uses the same frequency, our signals may interfere with each other and the receiver will not be able to successfully receive the data. So I'd like to use a frequency that someone else nearby is not using. So choosing the right frequency is important. Data rate we care about, range, frequency, transmit power we care about. And when we choose a wireless technology, we'd like to minimize cost. When we talk about a, a, the transmission of a wireless signal, in fact, we don't transmit at one frequency, we transmit a signal which is made up of multiple components, a range of frequencies. So, if we try to draw that on some plot where this is some frequ the frequency on this axis and this is the signal strength or some power level, then when we transmit a signal, say your laptop sends a signal to a Wi-Fi access point, that signal covers a range of frequencies and what I'll try and draw It may look something like this, where the signal has some center frequency, so the center point here. And, but the signal has power, a high power level, for a range of frequencies. So at about these points, let's call this the minimum frequency component and the maximum for our signal. And the difference between them is the bandwidth of our signal. So in fact, we transmit a signal which covers a range of frequencies, where that range of frequencies is the bandwidth of that signal. So this is the bandwidth. In practice, or in theory, it would be nice if it was a square plot here. In practice, it's not square. There's some uh, uh, cur curvature here. What that means is which when we transmit a signal, say from my laptop, it's got high power at these, frequency, at these frequencies, very low power at these frequencies, and close to zero power here. So it's as if there's no uh, transmission at these frequencies and, and beyond, up to infinity. When we talk about wireless technologies, often you hear about the frequency and it usually refers to the approximate center frequency. An example is wireless LAN. We'll use that Wi-Fi. What's the frequency used for wireless LAN? Anyone know or can heard, may have heard it or even see in the lecture notes? Wireless LAN. 2.4 gigahertz. So the most common frequency used for wireless LAN transmissions is 2.4 gigahertz. But what does that mean? In fact, when we transmit a signal, we transmit at a range of frequencies. This is the approximate center frequency. In fact, there are specific values. I don't have them on these slides. I want to talk about wireless networks. I want to show you some wireless devices today, but I cannot get my Wi-Fi to work on the laptop. This is the difficulty of wireless communications. For Wi-Fi, for example, and I cannot remember the exact value, the center frequency may be 2, let's say 2410 megahertz. 2.41 gigahertz because with Wi-Fi in fact we have multiple channels and each channel has a different center frequency 
So for an example, the center frequency of this signal may be 2.410 gigahertz or 2,410 megahertz. The bandwidth of a Wi-Fi signal is, I think, around 20 megahertz. So in fact, when I, my laptop transmits, it transmits signals across a range of frequencies where the minimum is, in this example, what? 2400 megahertz, and the maximum would be 2420 megahertz. You see the difference? 20 megahertz. Center, 2410 megahertz. So when we talk, when you hear the frequency of Wi-Fi is 2.4 gigahertz, it's an approximation of the center frequency. In fact, there are multiple center frequencies depending upon the channel available. So we care not just about the center frequency of our signal, but also the bandwidth consumed of that signal. Because if I transmit a signal with a center frequency of 2.41 gigahertz and a bandwidth of 20 megahertz, someone nearby may transmit a signal on a different frequency. To avoid interference, we'd like their transmission not to overlap with mine in the frequency spectrum. So someone else may transmit a signal with a different center frequency. let's say 2,440 megahertz. Same bandwidth, 20 megahertz. So therefore ranging from 2,430 up to 2,450. And in this case, two people can transmit, one transmitting this signal, the blue one, and another user in the same location transmitting this red signal, and because they do not overlap, they will not interfere with each other. Okay. If they overlapped, then we can cause interference at the receiver and we would not successfully receive data. So the bandwidth and the center frequency that we use is important uh, to know, so we know that we will not over or we not interfere with someone else. The larger the bandwidth, then if we have to share with other people, the less uh, range of frequencies that other users can use. So we try to minimize the bandwidth so that we do not interfere with others. But we generally try to maximize the bandwidth to increase the performance, the data rate. So there are a range of trade-offs to deal with, with the, the frequency management. The frequency and the bandwidth impact upon the data rate, impact upon the transmission range, how far we can send, interference, and the cost, because some frequencies are licensed and therefore have some cost associated. So it's important to choose the right frequency and bandwidth such that it meets your requirements. Any questions about this concept here, about center frequency bandwidths. We don't send a signal at just one frequency. In fact, it contains a range of frequencies. Some of you may remember some lectures from previous semesters that look at the, the sinusoid functions. S of t equals sine 2 pi t plus sine 2 pi, th 2 pi 3 ft and so on. It's related to this, multiple components. Any questions before we move on away from frequencies? In fact, we'll see the details of Wi-Fi in, in one or two topics time where we cover wireless LAN in detail and I'll show you the exact frequencies. This is just an example. I don't know if it's exactly this value.
This just shows the spectrum available for most uh, communication signals, ranging from hertz up to visible light, optical fiber. Okay, so some are wireless. Uh, we see some wireless technologies and, as well as others. So FM and radio, TV, some satellite transmissions, infrared, uh, optical fiber for light transmissions. Who gives you a frequency? Normally they're managed by international organizations, ITU and others, and then within countries by national organizations. So you cannot just go and transmit on any frequency. It's illegal. So you need to get a license or use one of the unlicensed bands. Let's move on one or two more general concepts before we look at some example technologies. With wireless transmission, we can generally classify between a point-to-point -point topology and a multipoint, point-to-multipoint topology. Point-to-point -point is when we use highly directional antennas. We have an antenna that concentrates the energy of our, uh, of our signal into one direction, and in the other directions, the energy is very weak. And therefore, to receive successfully, the receiving antenna must be located in the direction that the transmitter is pointed. That is, we have two antennas pointing at each other. If we slightly turn one of the antennas, they will not be able to communicate. So you need to carefully align the antennas for a point-to-point -point link. We can generally transmit over larger distances with point-to-point -point transmission, but it's more inconvenient in that you need to set up the antennas. What about my laptop? Point to point or point to multipoint, do you think? When you use your wireless LAN on your laptop, do you have to place your laptop in the right orientation to get a signal? No. It's not really a point to point wireless transmission. The antenna on your laptop is not very directional. It transmits energy approximately equal in all directions. That way, that way, up and down. All right, it's slightly different, but uh, it's not all going in one direction. So your laptop is considered a point to multipoint uh, topology, sometimes called broadcast radio. It's a radio signal. Broadcast means send everywhere. Don't send in one particular direction to one particular destination. Point-to-point -point is more inconvenient in that you need to set up the antennas. Same with your satellite, some satellite TV. You need to point the receiving antenna at the satellite. If you put it in the other direction, then you will not receive the signal. With point-to-multipoint, it's much more convenient because we do not need to configure uh, where the antennas are pointed. But we get more problems with interfering with people. And we'll see that in detail with wireless LAN. In the last four or five slides, I'm just going to go through some example wireless technologies. My slides are getting quite old. Uh, some of them I haven't updated for two or three years, even longer in some of the other, uh, other topics. But the concepts all apply. In some cases, some of the data that I use in the recent years has, has changed. That is, some of the speeds I list here may have even gone up. I'll mention them and I'll give you some other examples if there's a, a significant difference from what I show on the slides to what's current today. We'll look at different wireless technologies, starting with short-range short wireless communications. So communicating across a distance of centimeters, meters, maybe tens of meters. What do we have available to do that? I think you know Bluetooth. Bluetooth, you can send from a headset to your mobile phone over one or two meters, maybe. Um, different infrared technologies. Not so common today, but in the past, most laptops had an infrared receiver or infrared port for infrared communications. 
and other technologies. Zigbee is a, a one technology you may have heard of. IEEE 802.15.4 is a short range wireless uh, communications technology. Why do we use short range wireless comms? To connect devices together in many cases. A wireless desktop is an example. Connect your keyboard, mouse, monitor, all together without cables. Okay? Not so much for mobility, a little bit of mobility there, but mainly for convenience. <laughs> Who's interfering? Who's <laughs> hacking into my wireless network? Con connecting devices together you carry with you. Okay, you know about examples there. Uh, and more so today in automation, in, in factories, in houses, in buildings of collecting data, controlling systems, uh, controlling and monitoring devices. So installing sensors throughout an area, throughout a factory for example, sensing the environment, sensing what's happening, sensing the robots doing things in a factory and monitoring what's happening and in some cases controlling what's happening via communicating wirelessly between those sensors. Some ex example characteristics of some selected technologies. Bluetooth uses the frequencies approximately 2.4 gigahertz. The same as wireless LAN or Wi-Fi. So you can have interference between a Bluetooth link and a wireless LAN link. Bluetooth there's been revisions over time. The data rate's less than several megabits per second, but in fact has gone up. Uh, you can get higher speed Bluetooth. Tries to be low power, so the power consumed by the transmitter, or the power, con the transmit power is about several milliwatts. Okay. So that you can have a Bluetooth device that has a small battery inside it, which will last for a long time. The higher the transmit power, the lo less time that battery will last. Range is usually in the order of several meters with Bluetooth. Zigbee and more so now, IEEE 802.15.4 is used, developed for short range communications, especially for automation, control and monitoring systems can transmit at different frequencies, 915 megahertz and also at the same 2.4 gigahertz. Low data rates. So it's designed not for speed, but for low power consumption and low cost. It's for things where we don't need to transfer files, we just want to monitor maybe every few seconds, collect a small piece of data. We don't need a high data rate, we're talking about hundreds of kilobits per second. For, for such applications, and tens of meters. And there are a few others, infrared, not so common today, ultra-wideband is another one. These are some examples, they're not so good to look at, if you opened them up you would. This is an, I, a, inside there's a board which is, and you can pass around, you may be able to see inside, uh, this one has two boards in it. They, they are uh, small boards which support 802.15.4, okay, which is uh, used also by Zigbee. It's for wire, they're, they're called wireless sensors. They take two AA batteries, so you can open the case and you see there's no batteries inside them, but they just take two AA batteries and they also have some sockets to plug in in fact, on board they have a temperature sensor and an accelerometer and you can plug in other sensors. We've got a few other sensors like this one's a, a, a humidity and temperature sensor. This is a, a light sensor. It senses light. The idea is that okay, you put some batteries in them, you locate them in, across some building or across some area. They sense some, something about the physical environment. They sense the temperature, uh, the light, they sense motion and so on. And then they report that data back to some central computer. And maybe someone at that central computer can monitor what's happening. Or 
maybe can control what's happening. For example, sense the temperature. If it goes above some level, turn on the air conditioners automatically and turn on on and off lights and so on. So they communicate using 802.15.4, so at data rates, which is similar to Zigbee, at data rates of hundreds of kilobits per second at a frequency of 2.4 gigahertz. And again, because they used a low transmit power with two AA batteries in them, they should last for days, weeks, and possibly months in some cases. If anyone wants to use them for any, any uh, great idea, then we have about 10 or 11 of those wireless sensor devices. You can build your own network. Next step up, okay, from short range, several meters, up to medium range, or what we commonly know as Wi-Fi or wireless LANs, wireless local area networks, covering a room, an office area, a building, and sometimes a little bit further. Ranges from meters to hundreds of meters, depending upon the configuration. There have been different technologies for wireless LANs in the past, but the main one used today, we all know and use, is based on the standard IEEE 802.11. And it's been enhanced over time, different uh, enhancements. So you would have heard of 11A, 11B, 11G, 11N, which are just enhancements of the technology, improvements. You know where it's used, okay? You use it on a daily basis. Typically used in a point-to-multipoint configuration, like I said, the laptop transmits its signal in all directions, and as long as an access point is within range, it can receive and, and communicate. The most common frequency is 2.4 gigahertz, but there's another one which is, uh, is available, which is 5 gigahertz. It, and there are some differences in the characteristics of those frequencies. One of them being that with 5 gigahertz, generally the distance is much, much less, but there's less interference. There are less people using the 5 gigahertz frequency than using 2.4 gigahertz. And the range, and you would know from your own experience, is in the order of several meters, tens of meters, possibly 100 meters if we get outdoors. It depends upon the obstructions in the, in the vicinity. And the data rates in the past range for several megabits per second, 11 megabits per second. And now, when you buy a new laptop, usually supports at least 54 megabits per second, most likely up to hundreds of megabits per second. Okay. We're going to spend an entire topic looking at how that works, how wireless LAN works and we'll come back to see the, the specific frequencies, how they work, and you'll, you, you've used them on a daily basis, the, the wireless LAN access points, how they work, and uh, uh, how to set them up. So we won't go into detail here. Next step up over a larger distance is, or a different application even, is point-to-point -point fixed wireless. I have to turn off my wireless. Point to point fixed wireless. Point to point means we're typically using a point to point topology. We have one antenna, highly directional antenna, pointing at another. And fixed means those antennas are fixed in some position. We don't have mobility in this case. We'll see some exceptions when we go through some examples. There have been in the past some products that provide this technology which depended upon the company. So Motorola had their own way for doing it. Other companies had their different way. They could not interoperate. If you wanted a link from this campus to the Rungsit campus, 
In the past, you'd buy from one company. You couldn't buy equipment from two different companies. But nowadays, they've become, there's standards in use. And there is now a common standard, IEEE 802.16, referred to as WiMAX, for point-to-point -point fixed wireless links. Also, and not so common, but also for a cheap solution, 802.11, wireless LAN can be used. The purpose is to use as a replacement of point-to-point -point wide area network links. So the best example is our link between two campuses. We've got different options. We can pay a telecom company to use their wired network, for example, using PDH, rent or lease from them a, a digital circuit and use the wired network between our two campuses. Or, unlike we have done, we can put an antenna on the top of this building and an antenna on top of a building at the other campus, point them at each other, and using WiMAX or a similar technology, have a wireless link between the two campuses. And that's what we have in this case. And of course, our devices are fixed. Okay? It's not to provide mobility. And it needs to be configured in that the antennas have to be pointed in the right direction. WiMAX, as an example of a common technology used for this today, provides speeds up to around 70 megabits per second for that link. With a point-to-point -point link, the, because the energy is focused in one direction, usually interference is not a problem. With, it's hard to draw in two dimensions. Uh, we have an antenna. We have a point to point link. The with a directional antenna, the energy of our signal is concentrated in this direction. It doesn't go in this direction and it doesn't come out if you think in three dimensions from here. And so, therefore, someone else nearby can have another point-to-point -point link, and it's unlikely that they'll interfere with each other. Okay? So it's easier to have uh, multiple direct links, and as a result, get uh, higher speeds, higher data rates, less, like, less likely to, for interference and having to share the, the spectrum. So WiMAX provides speeds up to, for example, 70 megabits per second. There's been some improvements to get higher speeds. But usually that's over a range of several or 10 kilometers. The alternative is to drop the speed, use a lower speed, and get a larger range of up to, say, 50 kilometers. But with point-to-point -point fixed wireless links, we're normally talking about links that cover tens of kilometers maybe further. And data rates in the order of tens of megabits per second and up. There are some using unlicensed 2.4 gigahertz frequencies and some using specialized frequencies, say 11 gigahertz. WiMAX has a range of frequencies that are available. You can set up a very cheap link, uh, say from your home to your friend's home, if you have no obstructions between your homes, maybe you're out in the country somewhere, by using simply Wi-Fi access points and unscrew the antennas that come with it and you attach, highly, you attach directional antennas. So these are omnidirectional an antennas, if I can get it off. You buy a different antenna, one of those dish-shaped antenna, and just attach it here. Put the dish-shaped antenna on the roof of your house, point it at your friends, and you can cover a distance of several kilometers, in that case, with your normal Wi-Fi access point. So in fact, in special circumstances, wireless LAN can be used for fixed point-to-point -point links, but it's not so common. It's used in case where we want to be very cheap. We want a, a cheap solution. What does LOS mean? 
line of sight. It means between the transmitter and receiver, there are no obstructions. If you stood at the transmitter you'd be, and you had perfect eyesight, you'd be able to see the receiver. There's not a building in between. That's the general idea there. This is non-line of sight. We may have obstructions in this case. So, in fact, WiMAX can be used in two different modes, a point-to-point -point mode and a point-to-multi-point -point mode. In Thailand, for example, to use WiMAX or similar technologies, you need a license or special conditions. For SIT to get the antenna on the top, we had to go through months and months of processing to get the right license to, to do that. Another technology, satellite communications. In the case where we do not have wired links, we're too far away to provide point-to-point -point wireless links and satellite may be an option where we have a satellite up in space and we either have a point-to-point -point topology we have some station on the ground, an earth station that transmits up to the satellite and that satellite transmits down to another earth station point-to-point, -point, from this point to this point it's an option say for connecting from one country to another country the alternative is to use uh, uh, a wired link between them or a wired network and use, say, submarine cables, under, underwater, underground cables. Or a point to multi point topology where we have a transmitter, an earth station that transmits up to the satellite, and then the satellite broadcasts to everyone within range. Everyone who's within the footprint of the satellite can receive the signal. Satellite TV is the best example there. The TV channel transmits the signal up to the satellite. The satellite sends down. Everyone who has a receiver within range of that satellite can receive the transmission. And the range of the satellite depends upon the orbit of the satellite, okay? how far above Earth it is. So the lower it is, or the, the lower the orbit, the smaller the range. In a geo geostationary orbit, geosynchronous orbit, it provides a range of about covering a third of the Earth. So the range is in hundreds to thousands of kilometers. We will not cover the details of how satellite links work, it's just one other alternative. One of the more popular satellite internet service providers in Asia Pacific region is IP Star using the TICOM satellite, the Thai satellite for internet access. TV, radio broadcasting, telephone applications in, in locations where there's no mobile phone service, for example. Last one we, we, which we want to talk about and We'll mention the, the basics and then I'll give you a detailed example of some of the, uh, the commercial aspects of it is your mobile phone, mobile telephony, cellular communications. Where we have, we have a base station which plays a similar role to your access point in a wireless LAN network but different technology. We have a base station that transmits wirelessly to our mobile devices, our mobile phones. And then from that base station, it uses wired links normally out to the rest of the network and the rest of the internet. Who are the main telephone, mobile telephone companies in Thailand? Companies, organizations. DTAC. Anyone else? I'm new here. I've only been here for a few years. Who else? True. AIS. 
they would be the main three. There may be smaller ones, but they are the main three mobile telephone operators in Thailand. And then we have somehow related the two basically government organisations, CAT and TOT, who provide telecom services as well. And there's a mix between them also with mobile telephony, mobile phones. I'll go through some, de or some, some technical details and then I have a presentation that I've stolen from AIS that talks about the relationship between these companies uh, for mobile phone access and leads to 3G and, and some of the issues there. We'll go through that. So of course mobile phones for voice communications but nowadays for internet access, data communications as well. Okay, and that's what we're focusing on on this talk, topic and this, this course about uh, internet technologies, data communications. Ranges, in fact, the range of mobile phone, the base stations, uh, differs. It uh, depends upon where they're located, but they can be hundreds of metres to several kilometres, a few kilometres in distance. In terms of standards used for mobile phones, there have been two different paths taken in the world. There's been one path taken mainly come from European standards and one from North American standards. So in the past, and you know the terminology, uh, mobile phone standards and technologies have improved over time and the marketing uh, labels given to those improvements have been referred to different generations. Okay. So we had the first generation, the second generation, third generation, fourth generation, I'm thinking about the fifth, 4G, and people even talk about 5G, the, fifth, the next generation. Really, it's referring to a broad class of technologies used, where the first generation was really the old-style analog phones. And uh, they were bigger than this, okay? So they were large, large phones originally um, used analog transmission. 2G, second generation, moved to digital transmission. And the, the main one used was used a technology called GSM. Okay. In North America, there was an alternative called CDM, CDMA1. Uh, had a few different uh, names. Okay. So there were two different standards. And at some point, you couldn't use your phone, your GSM phone in the US, for example. But that's the, the, the second generation technologies. And then people started to using them not just for voice calls but for sending data traffic as well. Okay. To use them for internet access. And some of the, these are some of the acronyms that refer to the technologies used for data access. You don't have to remember them all. You, some of you already know. Some we'll talk about in more detail. For GSM, there was what was called circuit switch data, which was like using an old style dial up modem but using your mobile phone. Provided data rates of around, and I think it says in one of the later slides here, of around 14 kilobits per second okay, for data access, circuit switch data. And then that was improved, and there was GPRS, uh, which provided, and I'll go to the next slide, uh, general packet radio service, GPRS. But the idea was to use packet switching and, and send your data via a packet switch network instead of a circuit switch network. And we got data rates in the order of tens of kilobits per second. These give typical data rates for, the first one is downlink, download, and then upload. Okay. So there were differences. You, you could download faster than you could upload in most cases. And then that was improved, and uh, the name of the improvement was Enhanced Data Rates for GSM Evolution, EDGE. So now we're talking about data rates of 100 
200 kilobits per second download. And both GPRS and Edge were extensions of GSM. So GSM was a, a 2G gen a, a second generation technology. It was improved. GPRS and then Edge. Sometimes they're called what 2.5 G. They're not 3 G. 2.5 G or even 2.9 G in some cases. That is, they're not 3 G, but they're improvements over the original second generation technologies. We'll come to the others, the 3 G, in a moment. From the North American perspective, there was a different technology, CDMA1, and similar, that had some improvements over time. We're not going to cover them, uh, but a similar, similar uh, development. You know where we use mobile phones for internet access today. I think there's not much to say about that. What's the a very simple view of the network topology for a mobile phone network? Here you are. These are the bus base stations. And you see them. You see the towers. You see them on top of the buildings with different antennas. Often the antennas are not necessarily the dish antennas, but sort of uh, long, long rectangles like this. Long, long antennas about this size. And there might be multiple on a big tower on top of a building in that they're pointing in different areas, so they're sectorized. There's an antenna pointing this way, another one, and there may be multiple sectors that they provide coverage of. So they are the base stations. Okay? And the wireless link is only from your mobile phone to the base station, typically. Those towers, those base stations, have some wired links. And because each base station may have a range of let's say several kilometers, to provide coverage of the, an entire city, of all of Bangkok, we need multiple base stations. And to provide coverage of the entire country, we need hundreds, thousands of base stations. So we have a network operator, like DTAC, True, AIS, they build, their, build and locate their base stations throughout a city, throughout the country, and then connect them all together via their own network. We say the, the operator's core network. And that can be a complex network there. It may be covering the entire country. Of course, you use a mobile phone to make vo voice calls. And the typical mode was that you connect to a base station. Your voice, uh, uh, there's a circuit switch connection that goes through the network, operator's network, and goes to a gateway to the public telephone network the public switch telephone network, PSTN. And this is just the normal fixed telephone network. That's for telephone calls. So when you make a call, it goes to this gateway and then out to the telephone network. But when you use your phone for internet access, it goes through the network operator's network and then to a gateway to the internet. Through, to an internet service provider. And it goes through their network to the, whoever the destination is on the internet. So there was a separation of the telephone network and the internet for data communications. In recent improvements of, of the mobile telephone technologies, in recent generations, the idea is to combine them. That is, to make voice traffic to flow through the internet and throw all of the voice traffic current or in the old style when you make a voice call there's a circuit switch connection to the gateway and then out to the telephone destination with the new approach they use packet switch connection so you basically you use voice over IP for your voice calls and everything here, there's not two separate networks, but everything is treated as the one network here. It's all packets, it's all data. Some may be voice, some may, some may be requests for web pages, whatever. The idea is to treat all voice and data communications the same, on the same network. And that's 
more so in 4G, fourth generation technologies, is to combine them together. And to all use internet technologies there. So that's the simple view of the topology of a, a mobile phone network. The end users, base stations, and then we have a, a network, a wired network that connects them together. With GSM, the improvements to, to go up to GPRS and Edge were relatively minor improvements for the technology in the network, in the op core network, and on the base stations. So they were extensions to GSM and to upgrade. So let's consider AIS that has base stations all across Thailand. To upgrade from GSM to G GPRS and then to Edge required some minor upgrades in their network, their core network, and on the base stations. It didn't require complete replacements of the base stations. Okay? It didn't require completely new hardware, mainly software upgrades. So not so hard to upgrade. But the next step, where these are 2, 2.5G, two up to 3G, generally requires a major upgrade of hardware at the base stations especially. Okay? Because they're using different uh, transmitters uh, in, and different frequencies. So the next step from 2G up to 3G is a new system compared to GSM and 3G requires a, a major investment from the company to upgrade their network. One of the standards for 3G communications is called UMTS, Universal Mobile Telecom System. And there have been some variants as well. So there are different standards for 3G. And in terms of data rates, originally talking about 380 kilobits per second for data access. But since UMTS has been uh, released, there have been improvements and, uh, and further improvements. And first, there was what's called high-speed downlink packet access. High-speed packet access, the general acronym, or the general name. And there was one improvement to ins improve the speed of downlink, downloads, and one to improve going from mobile phone to base station, uplink. So we get high-speed downlink packet access, provided data rates on the downlink of up to 14 megabits per second. And then high-speed uplink packet access, so upload around up to about 6 megabits per second. And then further improvements were available called HSPA+, which was both uplink and download, talking about 42 megabits per second down, 22 megabits per second uplink. So that's from your mobile phone. So that's, that's still considered 3G technologies. They are, again, improvements or enhancements of the original UMTS. And generally not too hard to upgrade if you've got a UMTS original base station to upgrade up to HSPA plus using similar technologies, just mainly software upgrades. The next step up, in some cases called fourth generation, 4G, is another major upgrade to called long-term evolution, LTE. So a new system again. So from a company's perspective, a large investment to move from UMTS and HSPA up to LTE. So it takes more time to do that. Where are we today? What's the fastest you can download via mobile phone? Anyone? Anyone done any tests? 3G, yeah. Uh, and we'll talk about the, the companies shortly. But what about speeds? Has anyone noticed or measured any speeds for downloads? Some, some companies would advertise, I think, in the order of 14 megabits per second for so I think True supports 14 megabits per second, HSDPA. I'm not sure, maybe more recently it's moved up as well. 
Uh, so different companies, and it, not just in their entire network, in different base stations or different areas, they may have support for the newer uh, technologies here. In, the, in some areas, they may be limited to the low rates. Some areas, they don't have 3G, and you drop back to Edge or GPRS. So it depends upon where they've uh, deployed the technology in their network. But we see, and in a number of countries, this is common, HSPA+. Plus. Uh, so we're seeing data rates similar to and greater than wired technologies like ADSL. But this is your normally shared. That is, the more users accessing a base station, the less you will get. Okay? So it's not dedicated for you. It depends upon the operations of the company as to what speed you will get. But normally it's a shared medium in that if there are many people connected to the one base station, the data rate you're going to get is going to be much lower. Then, but if there's no one connected, then you may get high download speeds. Okay, so that's one of the limitations that we have. Whereas with, for example, if you want fast internet access at home, what have you got as a choice? All right, if you've got a telephone cable, you can use ADSL, up to 24 megabits per second in theory. It, or you could use your mobile phone for home internet access in theory up to 42 megabits per second down, but that may vary depending upon the other users in, in, in the vicinity. And in the future or even available in some, some countries we're talking about closer to hundreds of megabits per second download speeds. I'll, I'll return, I'll come back to the companies, with, but let's just present the summary here uh, where we switch to that. So with wireless networks, can be used in both access networks where the end user connects to the network, wireless LAN, your mobile phone, and also in core networks, in fixed point-to-point to point wireless networks of wireless LAN. And also satellite can be used in core networks. For in the access point, the purpose mainly is to provide mobility. In the core network is to uh, act as a replacement of cables. Generally, comparing wireless to wired technologies, for the same cost, Wired technologies are faster than wireless. Some rough comparisons shown here. Okay, inside your LAN, at the same cost or approximately the same, wireless LAN, 54, maybe 100 megabits per second, but shared. Ethernet, 100, 1,000 megabits per second. Home, in 2G, talking about hundreds of kilobits per second with mobile phone, up to several megabits per second with old ADSL. And even with 3G, you're talking about maybe 10 megabits per second up to 24 megabits per second. And even if you've got high-speed packet access, compared to, say, optical fiber to a building, there's a, a, a significant difference in speeds. So generally, wired technologies are faster than wireless technologies for similar cost. There may be some exceptions there. But, of course, wireless technologies often provide us convenience and mobility. The next... I'm going to show you uh, something you don't have, a presentation I've just downloaded from a website. It's, just, it's good to give some examples. Uh, but any questions about mobile phones? You all know how to use them. We will not cover the, the, the protocols and the standards behind, the, behind them, but it's nice to know, uh, be aware of some of the terminology uh, and some of the standards. Uh, First, some pictures. And again, these are from websites. No need to, 
to copy this down. We'll see this one later um, when we look at wireless LAN in details. This is the wireless LAN standards that have been developed over time. 802.11 <coughs> is the name of the standard and it's a physical layer standard. How do we transmit our bits as signals, as wireless signals? And it's been improved over time. So the original standard was in 1997. 802.11. The frequency band was the 2.4 gigahertz, the one we've mentioned. And the signal bandwidth was 20 megahertz. And originally a data rate, a maximum data rate of 2 megabits per second. But even as that was released, they were working on improvements. Both 11A and B. 11B was a popular one that provided 11 megabits per second. And an improvement in 2003 release was 11G, up to 54 megabits per second. Nowadays, most devices you buy new support 11N, up to, in some special cases, 600 megabits per second. But you see it uses what advanced, advanced antenna and te technologies, multiple input, multiple output. Rather than transmitting with just one antenna, you may see access points with right, two, three, or even four antennas. And they use some advanced technologies to receive the signal on multiple antennas to speed up the data transmission. But higher cost involved. And there are improvements expected in this next year and maybe the, the subsequent year. For very special cases, talking about gigabits around 7 gigabits per second, but using completely different frequencies and will cover very different scenarios. Not so much for covering a room or a building, but for very short distance communications, like uh, monitor to, to PC for uh, wireless uh, video. This one, and again, there's a link to the website from our course website that covers, contains this picture. Uh, it shows the evolution of the 3G or the, the mobile communication standards. So two, 2G here, GSM. In North America, they had CDMA1 and there was also TDMA. And in Japan and Korea, they had something called PDC. And that was improved to provide higher data rates. GPRS, for example. Then 3G, wideband CDMA, also called UMTS. Uh, edge fits in there, in this diagram. And then the improvements here of high-speed downlink packet access, high-speed uplink packet access, called sometimes 3.5G, 3.5. High speed packet access plus 3.9G. It depends upon the companies what they actually call it. It's more a marketing term. And long term evolution, and there's long term evolution advanced even here. And similar developments Wi Fi, wireless LAN has improved over time at about the same times, so 11N. Also, there's WiMAX, which has been improved for mobile WiMAX and WiMAX 2. And we, in the future, we'll have 802.11ac and AD for wireless LAN standards. So, as it says here, increasing efficiency, bandwidth, and data rates, so faster, better performing technologies over time. And this is the same or similar information, just a different, different picture, different perspective. Showing, focusing on 3G and moving towards 4G, long-term evolution. We're talking about data rates in the order of hundreds of megabits per second, tens of megabits per second per user. And in the future, maybe up to 100 megabits per second per user, download, for example. In the last 10 minutes, 
let's look what AIS say about themselves. This is one of their promotional presentations. I found it on their website. It's useful because it gives some, some statistics and some examples of their network and also some issues about the relationship between the companies for mobile uh, communications in Thailand. Because you know there are several companies that provide a service and you probably also know that there was this 3G auction last month and that's been a long time coming and different issues involved. We'll see some of these slides here. Just an example, you don't have to remember this. Uh, and we'll see the relationship between the companies. I'll skip over some slides. This is from August this year, so it's quite recent. So it talks about the mobile phone penetration in Thailand, 114%. What does that mean? Someone has more than one phone. That is, in a population of 68 million people, there are, what, around 80 million phones or, or, or subscribers, or not necessarily subscribers, phones. So people have more than one phone. Some people don't have a phone, some have more than one or, or multiple phones. Uh, what else does it show? So this, maybe this plot shows subscribers in Thailand, so in terms of millions, up to 78 million, and penetration rate. Um, here, subscribers' market share between the three companies, DTAC, True, and AIS. Here, TMV means True Move, but True in this case. So, AIS, 45%, True, 25%, DTAC, around 30%. So, the three main operators in Thailand. And similar based upon market share or a revenue. How much money they bring in. This one is tries to illustrate the relationship between the government organizations and the, the commercial operators. And it's quite complex. So and I do not understand the details, but we'll see what we can pick up from here. There are it's what's now called the MBTC. The, what is it? The National Broadcasting and Telecommunications Commission. So a government organization or a, set up by the government for managing communications and broadcasting inside Thailand. Allocating frequencies to organizations uh, and so the, the services can be provided. So not just mobile phones but also landline and, and TV broadcasting and radio as well. And then there's the two what were well, are primarily government organization, TOT and, and CAT. Okay? So they have been around for a long time, so providing telecommunications and, and cable communications throughout the country. So they have networks built through the, the country, wired networks. And then you have the commercial operators. And this is not just for wireless, but also wired. So the m ones we're focusing on, AIS, DTAG, TrueMove, and there's others for fixed line, for home phone connections. And the way that it's worked is that the, these organizations pay some license. They get the license for the frequencies. And then these commercial organizations get what it's called here a BTO contract, a build, transfer, operate. What they do is that TOT has the license for the mobile phone frequencies, right? not the 2.4, but the different frequencies used for mobile phone networks. But then AIS or the others, they get a contract to build the network. And so they build the network for TOT and transfer the ownership of that network to TOT, but then operate it for them. So AIS builds a network and then oper operates that network on behalf of TOT, because TOT has the license to use it, not AIS. So then when AIS makes money, people, the customers pay AIS, then a percentage of that money goes to TOT. 
because TOT has the license. So that's the, how it's operated in the past. It's slightly different, but that's the main way that the mobile phone networks operated. Some are to TOT, TOT some are to CAT. Uh, this gives a little bit of information about the frequencies available. NTC was the old organization before NBTC. And this is some special case frequencies which are allocated for, originally for trialing 3G networks, for doing test networks, for not to cover the entire country but to, inco to cover some areas. Uh, so we can see some examples here. TOT had a license for a 900 megahertz uh, mobile phone network and also a 2.1 gigahertz mobile phone network. And in the world, the most commonly used frequency from 3G is this one, 2,100 megahertz, 2.1 gigahertz. All mobile phones, 3G mobile phones, almost all of them will support this frequency. Not all of them will support the other frequencies, like the 900 megahertz and the 850 megahertz. Okay, in different countries it varies, but the most common one is the 2.1 gigahertz. So TOT had a license to have two networks or using two different range of frequencies. One of them, AIS, had the contract to build the, a network and to operate that, so in the 900 megahertz. Similar, the CAT, 850 megahertz, and who had that? DTAC and, and True had a, a contract to build that network and operate it on behalf of CAT at the 850 megahertz. Most of you who have 3G access will be using one of those two networks. In fact, sometimes when you buy a mobile phone, you, it specify, you can choose between the AIS version and the True version, or DTAC version because the mobile phone may only operate on one of these two frequencies. Most 3G phones will operate on the 2.1 gigahertz, but not all will operate on 2.1 plus 900 megahertz and 850 megahertz. Some will only operate on 850 or 900. So that's when you choose, you are stuck with one. You cannot necessarily use that phone on another operator. And that's the problem of some of these networks that, because not everyone uses it, you cannot easily move to other networks. TOT also had a license, all has a license for the 2.1 gigahertz, the popular one. And what they did is they contracted out to other smaller companies. Uh, who? iMobile, I think, had one contract and a few smaller companies called mobile virtual net network operators. They, TOT had the network and they just used their network. These smaller companies used the network and sold the service to us end users, customers. But that network of the 2.1 gigahertz didn't provide as much coverage as the, the ones built by AIS, True and DTAC. And they the frequencies that they're allowed to use, we can see the bandwidth available, 17.5 megahertz, 75 megahertz here, 25, and different bandwidths available to each organization. So it's a complex relationship between accessing those licenses and, and between the different com companies. Uh, so this concept of TOT has the license and then AIS goes to them and op builds the network and then operates it and all the money AIS gets, they pay a percentage to TOT. How much? A revenue share of well, between 20 and 30%. So everything you pay AIS, 20% or up to 30% goes to TOT plus some other, um, some other, uh, other charges. And similar, DTAC and True pay CAT around 30%. So of their income they pay to use that license. The idea then with this 3G auction was to license different frequent or different uh, channels or different uh, bandwidths in the 
2.1 gigahertz frequency range. And to auction, as you know, auction to these three companies eventually, DTAC, True, and AIS. So they could build their own network. They get the direct license. They don't get the license through someone else. As a result, they pay for that license and no longer have to pay TOT and CAT the <coughs> revenue share. So the idea from these companies' perspective is to reduce this to lower their costs. And that's uh, shown here. The idea was at this, this license, which was recent in the 3G auction last month, that they have to pay some uh, percentage of their revenue, and it turns out to be a license fee of 2% plus some uh, other, other fee for universal service of 3.75%, so around less than 6% that they pay, as opposed to 20 or 30%. That's the benefit for AIS, DTAC, and True. They pay much less to someone else to use that mobile phone license. And that's why they wanted this auction to go ahead. Uh, that's, I think, the main things uh, that we can pick up from here. There's a few other details. Um, OK, their roadmap. But again, we see their roadmap includes supporting HSPA plus long-term evolution for, for AIS. A network topology which is similar to what I showed, but a little bit more complex. But we have uh, base stations, switching centers, uh, uh, base stations, mobile phones, and this is the core network. And these are the gateways for the voice and the data. Our gateway to the telephone and to the internet. And I think that's all from there. The rest is about the company. Okay, so just a, an example, uh, at least in Thailand, that the mobile phone, uh, uh, the, the operators and the licenses is a complex thing, uh, but very important because it will provide higher data rate services in the future for all of us. Tomorrow we'll move on to the next topic about very basics of the internet and then a few th new things about the structure of the internet. Let's continue then.